Chiodo We must all strive to accomplish complete enlightenment for the sake of liberating infinite kind mother sentient beings. It's with that kind of altruistic motivation we call bodhicitta motivation that we should all participate in this teaching. uh, one of uh, the very important things uh, that our historical teacher Shakyamuni Buddha has um, uh, taught us is this that uh, all sentient beings uh, who are, are trapped in uh, samsara or sickly existence uh, is basically because of our own uh, you know, accumulation of uh, uh, karmic actions. <coughs> So in other words, that all of us uh, are born, if you will, in samsara or sickly existence, we call korva in Tibetan, but it's not that there is just one karma or karmic action uh, that has precipitated our rebirth in uh, samsara. As a matter of fact, um, that each of us has uh, created and accumulated uh, uh, karmas or karmic actions. So our individual karmic actions uh, have resulted uh, in our rebirth in different states of uh, samsara or sickly existence. Uh, because of uh, a, a, ver a variety of um, karmic actions that we as sentient beings have created and accumulated, in other words, there's this, all these variations you know, within the karmas that we have accumulated, so we also find uh, differences among ourselves in terms of our uh, you know, uh, experiences. Uh, in terms of uh, pleasurable and unpleasurable uh, experiences, or in terms of uh, uh, in happiness and suffering. Uh, as we you know, look within um, our own world environment and among ourselves as humans or the beings of this world, uh, we see uh, all kinds of differences uh, in terms of the way we look, 
you know, in terms of the forms we have uh, taken, or in terms of uh, the resources we have, you know, some are rich, some are very poor and destitute, and some seems to be doing really very really well and happy, so to speak, and others seems to be always miserable and, you know, uh, in, in a state of pain, and all these kind of differences that we exist uh, within uh, our world and between us as uh, fellows of this uh, uh, this world are basically due to uh, due to uh, our own uh, individual uh, karmic actions. So that that the around to the tongue of the around to pay, then around to mean tongue like most to pay, make tongue you get over. So that the that the day you know, but the day you know, but the day. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that all of us should try to understand that uh, all kinds of experiences, good and bad, that we go through in, uh, in this particular world, for instance, are due to individual comic actions that we ourselves have created and accumulated. In other words, what I'm saying is, it's not that there is this one, uh, how should I say, so to speak, creator out there who has created us in different shapes and forms and, you know, and going through all kinds of experiences. It is not as if there is one particular karma, you know, so to speak, you might call it a universal karma, just out there, and then that is, you know, uh, producing all these differences, uh, you know, between us. Uh, the point I'm trying to drive home here is that all of us have created and accumulated um, many different types of comic actions, and these have resulted in all these differences, you know, both good and bad, that we find, uh, you know, among uh, ourselves. Mm-hmm. <coughs> uh, it you know, it could not be just one karma, you know, that has resulted in all these differences. Because even when we think logically or rationally, that does not make any sense. How could just one karma, whatever that karma is, that it could produce all these variations in our experiences and uh, uh, life situations? Uh, for example, that um, you know, when we look at the different seeds which produce different things, right? We cannot think of just one seed, whatever that seed is. Maybe it is a seed of a wheat or a barley or a rice. It does not produce all kinds of grains in the world. You know, each has a different kind of a seed. The rice needs its own seedling or seed, and so is the uh, uh, you know, the, the the wheat and the barley, and you just name it. Uh, so in the same way. Uh, it's not possible for just one particular karma uh, to uh, bring about all these differences, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, between us. So the now we are all same in that, you know, we want everything to go well and smoothly in our life. We want success, we want prosperity, we want happiness, and uh, so we want all types of goodness. Uh, that we want the mental happiness, that we want the physical comforts, that we want you know, everything that is good and you know, beautiful and whatever. You know. But although we wish for all those things, but the fact of the matter is that all of our lives are not equal in those respects. You know, we have all these differences, as I just mentioned. So, that's <laughs> So 
So if we all are same in that we wish for the best of everything, uh, we do not wish for any kind of uh, trouble and pain and suffering and problem, but what we experience, seems to experience mostly, is uh, the difficulty and pain and problems, and things seem to be going more wrong than right. So what is happening? You know, what is really bringing all these things uh, that we go through in our life? So underneath it, what we really should understand is uh, the positive and negative karmas or the good and bad karmic actions that we ourselves create. So we have to understand the sources of the things happening in our life, both good and bad. Why things are ha good things are happening in our life and why bad things are happening in our life. So when we investigate that matter, if you will, then we, uh, we come to see that our own good and bad karmas are, uh, uh, you know, are bringing all these uh, you know, things in our life. <laughs> <laughs> we also need to understand that when we create positive karmas or the good karmas or the wholesome constructive karmas, it's just impossible for them to produce negative results because that is not in the law of nature. When you do something positive, it cannot. It's just impossible for it to bring negative uh, consequences. And let me give an example to illustrate my point. When we look at the nature of the planets like sun and moon, and uh, so they uh, illuminate our world. When the sun shines, when the moon shines, it's just impossible for the darkness to exist. Because it's not in the nature for the sunlight to produce darkness, and it's not in the nature of the moonlight to produce darkness. You see, because they dispel, if you will, uh, the darkness. Uh, so what I'm saying here is that if we do good, you know, we will have good. If we do good karmas, it's just impossible for this good karmas to bring just the opposite results, so the negative results. And for the same reason, if we do bad, we will have bad. If we do negative karmas, the negative karmas cannot and never ever will bring something good and positive. Um, so going back to the same example I used that just as the sun and moon cannot produce darkness, in the same way darkness cannot produce sunshine and moonlight, you know, because they are you know, uh, not in the nature of things, as you would say. So just as there cannot be light from darkness, and there cannot be darkness from light. That thing about the same sound tongues. So see, me give, me give less seven that tell that they be doing in June. That me give, give less that tell that they be doing in June. That they pick up and they just sound tongues. Me give less. So just as I've given these examples, all of us need to really reflect on this fact that if we or I do something positive karma, then it cannot bring negative result. And if I do something negative, then it cannot bring uh, positive results. Yes. And I think uh, our ultimate wish, if you will, or the goal is to get rid of uh, every kind of suffering uh, and every kind of unwanted, uh, uh, you know, uh, problems. Uh, that thing so if that's what we want, you know, if we want to see that, uh, see an end to suffering and problems for good, then what we really need to practice or do in terms of actions is that uh, stop creating uh, negative karmic actions and whatever negative karmic actions that we have already created and accumulated is all done. 
you know, said and done, as you would say. Now, the only thing we could do is uh, purify ourselves of uh, negativities. So we purify all the negative karmas that we have already accumulated, and we, uh, you know, we try not to create any more negativities. So that is the practice uh, we need to uh, do. You know what you can do? Slumber ladies on nature is. Rang, Rang, Tama, Rang, Tama, Lule, Lage, Dibba, Hemma, Dibba, Mikir, Saik, Lage, Dibba, Mangusta, Dusin, Tor, Sadiris. At the Mavazo, the Mavazo, I caress, and the Chabasha, Chabba, the top git tongue against the Chabasha, who's gone on door. As General Che or Lama Songaba has said, and Gesher quoted lines from his memory, he said, that especially it is very important for us to purify ourselves of a karmic obscuration. Okay, a karmic obscuration. And the way we can do that is through our purification practice or through confession practice, shakpa in Tibetan. But the confession practice, it must include, M-U-S-T, must, uh, include uh, what is known as uh, the four uh, opponent forces or the four powerful antidotes in Tibetan called Nyanbo Topshi, literally means four antidotal powers. So if we apply the four antidotal powers in our confession and purification practice, then we can uh, get rid of, uh, you know, uh, karmic obscuration uh, from within ourselves. Mm. And uh, in the words of uh, Jeru Mbuchi or Lama Tsongkhapa, he says that we should uh, always or consistently uh, you know, apply uh, the four antidotal powers uh, to purify ourselves of negativity. So I think that's very important. Otherwise, uh, we might uh, get into this kind of a mentality or the mode of thinking that, you know what, well, I'm going to dedicate uh, myself to do this practice for a week or, or maybe for a month or maybe for a couple of months as if that would be enough. Okay? But when we think of all the negative karmas we have accumulated from many past lives, you know, you know, then we can see that, uh, you know, doing this kind of practice for a certain, you know, period of time may not be, uh, you know, enough. Uh, we need to uh, consistently apply ourselves into this purification practice uh, so that we are able to get rid of all the karmic uh, obscuration. Sometimes mm -hmm. Well, some might uh, entertain this kind of thought, you know what, I'm really not capable of practicing, you know, that kind of thing for a long time and consistently. Uh, maybe there is an easy way out. Maybe reciting some kind of a mantra, you know, incantation, because I heard that's so powerful. Well, that might do the job or the miracle. Okay, so if I recite some kind of a mantra, you know, then I might be free of all the negativities I've accumulated. The answer is no. Okay, and some might think that, oh, no, no, well, maybe I can request, you know, someone to perform what is called the POA, the transference of consciousness practice, which means basically you are elevating your state of consciousness to a higher state of existence through that powerful practice. It's okay, maybe I can request a Lama to do that, okay? So then that's the easy way out. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is, if we have um, accumulated you know, so much negativity, metaphorically speaking, that we are carrying this heavy load of negativity, and then we hope that by reciting some mantras or requesting a lama to do some kind of a power trick, or I shouldn't say trick, practice might do the miracle, uh, it is not going to happen. Okay. So, so, Rang Sabe, Lady Dubat is joined to Kachem Boris, to Jundini, Kitakachem Rekanam Boris. So we cannot, um, how to say, 
um, daydream as if I want to go to the pure land so maybe request a lama to perform the transference of consciousness this high sounding profound practice and that will do it for me or I'm going to recite some powerful mantras or so called and then I will be just fine uh, it's just a daydreaming and it's not going to uh, happen so what is really important for us to know is just you know um, so to speak um, down, be down to the earth and understand that I need to take the responsibility and I need to purify my negative karmas and I need to create positive karmas. It's through my own efforts, through my own practice that I need to grow spiritually. There is no you know, uh, other way of, uh, uh, how should I say, no easy way out. So, Tata, today's in any part so when we engage in uh, spirituality or spiritual practice, we call Dharma practice, we have to see that what we really practice becomes pure spiritual practice. So when I say that we should see our spiritual practice really does become pure spiritual practice, what I meant is there are so many things that go along with our practice that we need to keep in our mind. At the beginning, we need to cultivate proper motivation. Right? Motivation plays a very uh, significant uh, uh, and, uh, and essential uh, role in our spiritual development. And then when we actually do the practice, whatever the practice we do, we have to do it very properly. Right? We have to do it with mindfully and properly. And then we need to conclude our practice properly as well. So when everything is done properly, beginning, middle to the end, motivation, actual practice, and the conclusion of the dedication, then our practice really uh, uh, could become pure uh, spiritual practice. <laughs> One of, relatively speaking, of course, um, um, convenient uh, practices that we could do uh, to uh, purify uh, tremendous uh, negative karmic actions we accumulated is to cultivate uh, compassion uh, to and for other sentient beings. When we truly wish others to be free from suffering and its causes, when we genuinely feel that, you know, we are not uh, putting on a role or act here, but we truly cultivate that sense of compassion within us. And not only that we uh, cultivate compassion as an aspiration, like how nice it would be if beings are free from suffering. And that's a wonderful thought. But if we can somehow, how should I say, um, bring action into this kind of thinking that, that may I be able to do that for sentient beings. You know, how nice it would be if beings are free from suffering. May they soon be f freed from suffering. And may I be able to do that for sentient beings. Then I think our compassion really becomes a very powerful compassion. You see, we are not just simply wishing others to be free from suffering, but we are also putting the responsibility upon ourselves that I would like to do whatever I could, you know, to bring about uh, that, uh, uh, that kind of a result. So along with that, cultivating compassion for sentient beings without you know, discriminating among them as you know, this and that or whatever. Uh, and then also if we always remind ourselves in everyday life that I'm going to see that I don't bring harm to anybody. I'm not going to harm anyone through my actions. 
Okay, uh, I think then it will make a you know how to say it, it becomes really meaningful and make a difference in our everyday life. You know, we commit ourselves every day not to harm anyone, do anything that is harmful to others. You know, grounded in uh, the compassionate uh, uh, feeling. Mm-hmm. That's And also we could cultivate, or we should, as a matter of fact, cultivate love uh, to and for sentient beings. Love is defined as a a state of mind wishing uh, others to be happy. And uh, so we uh, could do this kind of meditation in which we cultivate uh, uh, thoughts such as uh, how nice it would be if beings find happiness or they're endowed with happiness. May they find happiness they are seeking. May I be able to help them find the happiness they are seeking. So when we cultivate these positive attitudes of the thoughts, now we are cultivating love you know, for uh, sentient beings. And again, I, rem- I want to remind all of ourselves that as we cultivate love and compassion, we should see that our attitudes are not biased in the sense that we cultivate love and compassion for some, but then not for others. Okay, that is a discrimination right there. Uh, we want to cultivate love and compassion equally towards, uh, uh, towards sentient beings. And uh, so when we cultivate love and compassion, what happens is when sentient beings find happiness they're seeking, or they, when they're doing really well, now we find ourselves rejoicing in that. That's what we actually wish them to be. So we are not going to be jealous of them. We are not going to be envious of sentient beings being successful and happy. That's exactly what we said we want them to be, you know, to have. So that's the... And then we also try to move, uh, I mean, further in our uh, development, uh, uh, spiritual development, if you will. That now we consider that it's not really <coughs> enough to simply wish sentient beings to be free from suffering and its causes, or wish them to have happiness in the causes. But as actually, I want to become an enlightened being or a Buddha to be able to help sentient beings, you know, find all of these things, you know, I'm wishing, uh, wishing for them. So as we um, reflect on what I'm just explaining to you that, well, the best thing to do for sentient beings is if there's a way I can help them to become complete enlightened beings. Okay, if they can be in the complete state of enlightenment, then everything would be perfect. Okay, just the way I want it, you know, for them. But in order, you know, to do that, first I need to work with myself. Okay, because when I am just like anybody else, everybody else, well then, you know, all this thing about I want to help them or do something, the fact of the matter is I don't have the abilities to do that. It's nice to wish them to be happy, nice to wish all those things for beings, but the fact of the matter is I myself am limited and I don't have the abilities to do that. So in order to have the abilities to fulfill all these wishes for sentient beings, I need to be enlightened you know, uh, for the sake of sentient beings. So that's how we cultivate an uh, altruistic uh, uh, state of uh, uh, mind. So by cultivating great compassion, great love, and uh, bodhicitta or altruism, we're able to uh, purify uh, ourselves of uh, uh, an incredible amount of uh, uh, negativities and uh, delusions. So uh, 
so what I'm explaining to you is, you know, all the things that we can meditate on or we can cultivate within our own mind through meditational practice. So all the things I'm talking about are something that we need to cultivate through meditation. It's not something to be talked about or discussed, you know, if you will. And then as we are cultivating these um, positive attitudes within our mind, now if we can also reflect on the ultimate nature of all these things, in other words, the emptiness of all the things involved in our practice, then that really becomes a very powerful antidote to uh, uh, counteract our, our delusions. For example, when we cultivate uh, compassion for sentient beings, I am the meditator, or we are the meditators. And what we are cultivating is uh, compassion, or makaruna. And for whom we are cultivating this uh, compassion are the sentient beings, right? So all these three things, we call these are the three uh, agents or the three uh, factors, uh, are empty of inherent existence. Nothing exists in and of itself. Everything is merely labeled, you know, by terms and concepts onto basis of imputation. Okay? So everything exists as mere labels. Nothing exists in and of itself, objectively. Okay? Now this is true as we cultivate love. Right? I'm the meditator who is cultivating love. Love is what I'm cultivating for others. And others are the objects for whom we are, I'm cultivating love. But none of these phenomena, if you will, exist in and of itself or objectively. Okay, everything is just labeled, you know. And we think about the same thing as we cultivate altruism or bodhicitta. Now we are reflecting on the ultimate nature or the truth of all this phenomena, what we call emptiness or shunyata or sunata in Pali. Okay, so by meditating, this is how we are meditating on love, compassion, altruism, as well as emptiness. Yes. Commitment <laughs> Uh, so these are the things that all of us should uh, you know meditate on you know uh, uh, every day. Uh, of course, when we need to go to work, okay, we don't have much time to do this, I understand. But then we could, before we go to work, if we can get up a little early, then we have a little bit of time to reflect on these things, meditate on. Then we go to work, okay, where we maybe try to maintain these attitudes. But then in the evening we go back, and before we go to bed, then again we, uh, you know, meditate on these things again. Okay, and many of us have the what we call the commitment practices, daily practice, which is our commitment. So as we are doing our commitment, we can incorporate these things within our practice, and maybe we are reading the prayers, or we are just reciting, but at the end, we should make a little bit of time to contemplate, to reflect on these things, to meditate on these uh, things I just uh, explained. Mm -hmm. And then the days we don't have to work, or we don't have to work at all, which would be nice, I think. Uh, then we can do many sessions of meditation on these things. We can meditate on these things many times a day. No, no. 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 Uh, 
And then, of course, as uh, Buddhist practitioners, uh, if that's what we, you know, we have um, become, then we need to uh, take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. We call the three jewels or the three ratnas in every day. Because we need to ground ourselves in the refuge practice. Because by um, take, uh, I'm going for refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, uh, we are able to um, just accumulate uh, the merit uh, to be able to fulfill our uh, both temporary and ultimate uh, uh, purposes. So, see, and the Shasol and Dogana, Shasola, Yunke, Gani, Sanjay, the Kate again, the Javanish, Sanjay again, the Tangy, the Duke, some other Sandu ship. Run the Shura Kalon, Dogan, and the Shore, Telepe, Mimi, D. Javi, and he asked Sanjay again to get some other and do see me as Sandu Shangers. Then it's soon. Uh, it is said that uh, because enlightened beings are in all the directions, so it doesn't matter which direction we are you know, um, facing or we are uh, traveling to. If we're going to the east, we can think of all the Buddhas in the east, enlightened beings, and take refuge in them. If we're going to the west or facing west, then we can think of all the Buddhas in the west, you know, and take refuge in them. Mm, yes. That thing is start causing something my like humanness. And now we are going to go back to where we left off in this uh, text called uh, Miscellaneous Collection of uh, Kadamba Geshe's Advices. Mm. Um, you know, this text uh, um, is, if you will, uh, a, a, a compilation of, um, you know, questions uh, and answers. You know, uh, and so the, in that sense, I think you know those of you who could come once in a while uh, to the teaching, uh, these uh, things should uh, will still will turn out to be practical and helpful to you. Mm-hmm. <coughs> And as we know, um, it is uh, the great Indian uh, Acharya or the Master Atisha, whose complete name is Dipankar Shijan Atisha, uh, one of the you know the, the greatest uh, Indian Buddhist masters of his time and at other times too. So he's the one who is answering. Uh, the questions um, posed by uh, some of his disciples. Saba, that kind of question is quite hard. Then Saba, so that you know, Saba, so the Jogi, Jaga Kalama, she, that well, then they can look good in well, you brace. Just for the sake of, um, I mean, new people, if anybody is new here uh, for today, uh, just to give you a sort of historical background to this is um, uh, Atisha. Of course, uh, is an Indian teacher, master. Uh, but then he was invited to Tibet in the 11th century, and he lived in Tibet for 17 years. You know, so uh, in a sense, we have that uh, you know connection with Adisha. Uh, uh, in his time, uh, uh, there, there was uh, the great monastic uh, university of Nalanda, and where there were many, you know, uh, uh, erudite scholars and uh, realized uh, practitioners uh, of his time. But uh, he was the abbot of this uh, Nalanda monastic university. Maybe introduce what it was the president of the university, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, and that's who we are talking about here. Mm. Yeah, 
Of course, we cannot compare him to uh, the, the, the today's uh, you know, presidents of the universities I mean, because they are more like administrators and they make a lot of money and they're paid well and uh, so their whole thing is to run uh, the administration. Of course, Adisha did not have those responsibilities and he was never paid and you know, there was no such thing as paying him. But his really main responsibility was to uphold the spiritual tradition and if anybody had any questions and doubts, then it was his responsibility, if you will, to clear up those doubts and to provide answers to the uh, to the questions. So, um, so we must not equate him with uh, today's uh, CEOs and the, whatever they are called or the presidents of the universities. Now in those days, uh, I think um, um, all the scholars at the Nalanda Monastic University, for example, um, for lunch, uh, they would go out for arms begging, and that's how you know they, they were supported. And then they just come back, and then they do their study, they do their meditation, they do their practice. So that's you know they didn't have to worry about many other things, you know. And um, and, and uh, Adisha did not have to worry about uh, running the administration of the university. I mean, his job was you know to use today's language more than his job was uh, to teach them and uh, to uh, clarify doubts uh, and uh, so forth. So students, of course, do not have to worry about taking loans and all kinds of things that we need to today. And don't need to just you know strap the computers and the big bags you know to, to one's body and then walk around on the campus. You know those things did not you know exist and there was no need for them. So that point, so they, no. Uh, so when uh, Adisha was invited to Tibet uh, for a certain period of time, uh, he lived uh, uh, in a place called Nyetang, uh, uh, close by uh, Lhasa, uh, capital of Tibet. No. No. So when Atisha was uh, living in this uh, place in uh, Tibet called Nyetang in central Tibet, uh, three other disciples of Atisha, he has so many disciples, and probably we don't need to go through the names uh, so that you don't get confused. Uh, anyway, the three disciples, uh, they asked him a question about uh, what is called uh, Sema, Brahmana of Valid Cognition. Because in, in India at the time, there were many different kinds of philo philosophical tenets and the traditions exist, right? So they have to do with valid cognitions and all those uh, kind of stuff, perceptions. And so these three disciples asked Adisha about, uh, uh, about uh, Pramana or valid uh, cognitions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Drupta uh, is translated in English as tenets, or sometimes it could be translated as philosophical schools of thought, I think. And of course, uh, we can uh, I mean, categorize uh, broadly the philosophies into the Buddhist tenets, or the Buddhist schools of thought, and the non-Buddhist schools of thought. So at that time, uh, there were five non-Buddhist uh, tenets, or schools of thought. Mm. 
And those um, the proponents and the followers of those uh, non-Buddhist schools of thought, five of them, they were not easy, really, I mean, uh, to be challenged or easy, because you can't easily dismiss them, you know, you're kind of a naive and, you know, a weird sort of thing. They were very good in, in, in their logic and in their thinking. Yes. Uh, but within the Buddhist school of thought, or the tenets, uh, we talk about four uh, schools mm. of thought. Uh, we have uh, Chedamava, mm. or Vaibhashika, or Realist, and Dodeva is a uh, Southern Tigers, or the followers of their called Sutras, literally translating. Uh, then Sensampa. And then there is the Chitta Martin on the mind only school of thought. Umapa. And then there is the uh, middle way uh, school or the Madhimic uh, school of thought. Uh, so basically, uh, these three disciples asked Adisha, you know, uh, questions relating to these different uh, uh, tenets. Uh, within Buddhism, you know, Vibhasika school of, you know, uh, tenets, or the um, Southern Tigers, or the Chittamatrins and Madhimikins. Mm. 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 And uh, Adisha responded uh, to their question saying that, uh, yes, uh, there are many uh, schools of tenets of philosophy within Buddhism and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and in, in other uh, traditions. No, no. That you are raised, Ghana. Yes. That they come to you, someone knows. Yes. No, my number to be two one is. That is not the only day. Yes. So, but all of them are, he said, deal with uh, 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 deal with the concepts or conceptual thoughts. You know, it, it is as if then you have to deal with the whole string of the conceptual thoughts. So it basically means it's vast, and you know, have, you get, you go into the realm of concepts, you know, and the constructs. Number So in other words, he said, if you have to go through all of them, it will be just an endless thing. This is basically, you are looking at like a mala or a raw tree, you know, you know it's just it's exactly. a complete whole. So like that, there will be just, you know, this continuous uh, conceptual thoughts and constructs, you know, dealing with all these tenets. No, that you didn't do. And so basically, uh, Adisha is telling them, you know what, if you have to go through all of the things, it will be like endless things to talk about. And basically, because there is no end to people's thoughts and the concepts which arise in our mind and the constructs, you know, which uh, you know, arise in our mind. So it will be just endless thing. And in some way, uh, there is no need to go through all of that. Uh. So he said, you know, if we have to go through all of those things, there is not enough time in our life. You know, life is short. It does not have enough time to go through, you know, every concept and construct and tenet that exists. And I think that's uh, really very relevant and good, uh, good you know, it's something relevant to us. So we need to think about that. Mm. So he said, you know, this is the time we need to try to grab the essence. We need to bring the essence, well, the essential points together and get hold of them. It's not the time to, 
you know, go through every concept and tenet and the construct that exists, and that is just going to be endless. And you go do it, do you? I also do it, Karen. Is it so? Don't you some other beta? So basically he's saying that, you know, just get to the points, as you would say, essence, and then practice it. Yeah. Mm. I think that's all we want and we need to do, right? Uh, often we don't really um, uh, think about uh, the uh, transitory nature of our life. You know, we really don't think about how long we, our life is going to be. It's just we feel like it's going to be there forever. Uh, but now we need to really consider that. Uh, we make grand plans and all kinds of projects, you know, programs, as if we are going to live forever, or at least for a long, 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 long time. So all that planning indicates that we are not, you know, preparing of uh, to live soon, you know, and we are not preparing for such thing as our life could come to an end any time. Uh, much of our time is spent uh, in doing all kinds of worldly things such as, you know, how can I defeat my enemies and conquer the people and the things I don't like, and how do I take care of and uh, all the people I'm attached to. And so basically, uh, you know, we, our life becomes very busy and hectic, you know, um, based upon all these categories and the divisions and discriminations, we, uh, I mean, we, we impose on things like friends and relatives and enemies and the strangers, and then we react differently to all these things, and that makes our life hectic and busy, so we are not left much with the time uh, to think positively and to do practice, because that is the last thing you know, uh, has a priority on our list. We are so busy with attachment, anger, hatred, and then, you know, uh, all the actions that follow from them. Then the thing about the tell a long map is, tell a long map is, so that you can do it to you, think about the magic is a lot of you. So let us maybe memorize, if you will, or imprint these two simple statements in our mind. There's not much time in life and get to the essence. Oh, yeah. And I think they are really asking, uh, you know, very good questions. Uh, then they, they ask, like, you know, so what do you mean by get to the essence? You know, how do we synthesize the essence or the bring the essence or the essence thing together? What do you mean by that? <laughs> And I think she has said, uh, you know, cultivate uh, love, compassion, and altruism, or bodhicitta, are for all sentient beings who are equal to the infinitude of space. Sentient beings are, you know, as limitless as the infinite space is. So cultivate love, compassion, and altruism for them. So it's a idea that Nankata Nyampe, Sage Tom Jela said to Tony, that didn't papi a Tony, I'm a so dread, Tony, they need dying sentence, and they need the companion, but some tongues. So when we, you know, listen carefully to the, what Atish has said, he said, cultivate love, compassion, and altruism for all sentient beings equal to the infinitude of space. So that means there's nobody to be left out or excluded. You know, he did not say that, you know, forget about the enemies or those who you don't like. He didn't say that. He said all sentient beings equal to the limitless space. Mm. And I have uh, very briefly, though, I mean, uh, uh, talked about how to cultivate uh, I mean, love and compassion uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, 
Uh, so as I, I mean, advise all of ourselves that we need to cultivate love and compassion in our everyday life. And also here, Adisha says we need to train our mind uh, in, 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 in cultivating uh, altruism, a Bodhisattva's attitude. Mm. So what do we mean by train our mind? Is that, you know, because we do not have altruism in, within us yet. So we need to make efforts to train our mind to, you know, if you will, uh, to uh, transform our mind so that we are able to experience uh, altruism. If we do not cultivate and experience great love, great compassion and altruism, even if we practice tantra and mantra and you know all the other things you, you, you talk about, or we, we cultivate meditational deities, we call yidam, we are not going to achieve anything. No. So why is that and how is that, if you ask? In order to uh, cultivate a meditational deity, first we need to receive uh, an empowerment, tantric empowerment, or initiation. In order to receive an empowerment or what we call Abhishek, you know, we need to train our mind in the common paths and practices. That is like a prerequisite. No. As Jerumbuche or Manjushri Lama Tsongkhapa stated elsewhere, in case of quoted the lines from his memory, he said like, you know, having become a suitable vessel uh, through training one's mind in the common paths and practices, then, meaning that you should go for the Tantra. Okay? So if, when, if we don't train our mind in those common paths and practices, even if we go and uh, receive empowerment, in the first place it's very doubtful. Do we really receive empowerment or not? So, uh, in that context, the common paths and practices, you know, basically involve cultivating what we call um, the three principal paths. Uh, renunciation, or the determined wish to be liberated, is called ngejung in Tibetan, or sometimes we translate as aversion to samsara's misery. And then we need to cultivate altruism or bodhicitta, bodhisattva's attitude. Then we need to cultivate the wisdom gone beyond, the wisdom realizing uh, emptiness as it is. These are called the three principal paths. So we need to train our mind in these three principal paths in order to receive uh, tantric empowerment. <laughs> So great compassion, great love, and altruism, so these are really I mean, key common paths. Uh, um, and uh, so we need to cultivate them, and to cultivate them, as it is stated here, that we need to accumulate merit, punya in Sanskrit, or virtue, and we need to accumulate wisdom or insight or jnana. <laughs> So we need to pursue what we call the two types of accumulation, accumulation of merit, accumulation of wisdom, and then whatever merit and wisdom we accumulate, we need to altruistically dedicate them, you know, to uh, reach complete enlightened state. You know, we need to dedicate all of that for both self and others 
to be in the complete enlightened state. Then verse, they come to that more than the shenis, more she, more you down, more you can say down. I tell some of the rangi don't buy anything him and she rangi did come to it, did come to it, rangi did don't buy. Sing it, Madam Jumata with Hippie Jason. That rangi did don't buy. Don't say any pay, Madam Town, any Jumata, Madam Tab, Jumata, that lady sent on race. Yan rangi did grubby, the lady who was in the government. Moata, Hoje Zeta, the Tomalo, a Ram Hoas and Kenta, Tomalo de Malam Tabu, Juma Tabu, the Arangi Tombach, you may sometimes. So as we accumulate merit and wisdom, and we altruistically dedicate them for both ourselves and others to be in the complete enlightened state, uh, we need to uh, you know, base that in the understanding of how everything is just like dream and uh, just like a magical creation. In other words, we need to reflect on the emptiness of all these things. Like, now we are doing the dedication, so we are the practitioners or the dedicators. If there's no word, let's make one. So, uh, and what we are doing is the dedication. That's our practice. And uh, so we dedicate all this for the sake of sentient beings to be enlightened, right? That is our goal. So all these three things should be seen like a dream or things we see in a dream, or just like a magical creation. Nothing exists independently in and of itself. Nothing exists from its own side. You know, everything is labeled, as I was explaining to you before. You know? So we need to reflect on the emptiness of our dedication practice. Otherwise, we might do a dedication, but then we kind of grasp at the inherent existence of dedication, which is not the right thing to do. Mm. Rangi je madupa da, rangi je tomba si zani, tu samara yeme samkong jamaris. So as we talk about how things don't exist inherently or objectively from their own side, now we must not conclude, well, that means things don't exist at all. You know, we are not saying that. We are not saying that things don't exist at all. Tati yeme tu samtomba yina chetal nungu yaris. But if we deny the existence of things as they exist, then we become a nihilist. We have fallen into the extreme of nihilism. But on the other hand, if we say, that, oh yeah, yeah, they, yeah, it's not that they don't exist, but they do exist, but they exist you know, inherently, then we have become eternalist, or we have fallen into the extreme of eternalism, you see. So um, we need to avoid those two extremes. You know, and be on the you know, on the middle path, if you will, uh, as we deal with these practices. Some of them tell us that some of them tell us that we must have the children. That the tiny book on the mountain, man, but the teaching then right it is. So that's why we often talk about uh, the profound middle path, right? What does the middle mean? The middle means that you avoid something on the right side or something on the left side. It's right in the middle. So you're avoiding two extremes on either side. So that's how when we avoid extremes of nihilism and eternalism, then we are on the middle ground or the middle path. Uh, maybe among uh, you, there are those uh, who uh, recite the Heart Sutra. Okay? And then when you do that um, you know, prayer uh, or the Sutra, you come across uh, many uh, negative statements. Um, you know, it says like, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no sound, no this, no that, whatever. Okay? And so as you go through that whole list of no, this and that, but if you have been thinking like, okay, these things don't exist at all, so that means you have fallen into the extreme of nihilism. You have become a nihilist. You know, you got you know, on the wrong side of the thing, and, uh, and, and uh, so that means you are not on the right track. So in order to understand the middle path, we need to be able to understand the difference between, you know, what is non-existent and uh, what is non-inherent existence. Okay, there's a difference between non-inherent existence, or the absence of inherent existence, and non-existence. Mm -hmm. 
all we should, we should understand the difference between, you know, what call, what do we mean by things don't exist in a particular way, inherently. But what do we mean, mean uh, that when we say things do exist? Well, so we understand the distinction between those two things, then we will be able to be on the middle path. So when we say that things don't exist, what we mean is things do not exist from their own side. Okay, we don't mean things don't exist at all. What we mean is things do not exist just the way they appear to exist to our perception. They don't exist in that way. Okay, mm. but they do exist. How? Well, they exist dependently. Okay, as I was explaining to you before, they exist as a mere labels. Okay, everything is merely imputed by terms and concepts. That's much. You know, no more, no less. That's how they exist. Okay. Right. Because if we really deny the things which really exist, like, oh, I don't have eyes, I mean, that's just gone crazy. I mean, what is it? I mean, there's nothing to talk about. And if we, call, you know, if we go and sit pointing at things that they exist, like, you don't exist, my eyes don't exist, this don't exist, um, basically we have become, you know, psycho. <laughs> だけじゃないですね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。
In short, we dedicate our merits for all kind mother sentient beings to be free from the fears and dangers of two types of mental obscuration, obscuration to personal liberation called nirvana, and obscuration to omniscient state, and may we all reach complete enlightened state quickly. Yeah, Allah. Yeah.